Hey there, it's Elvin Tempest, and I am super excited to be here talking about something I've been working on for, oh, probably a little over a month now. I started doing research for it a while ago, and now I'm just getting to record it, which is the first step, and the first cut is the deepest or something. Um, Yeah, so this video is going to be about the Taventer Imperium. Now, I should say before anything, there will be spoilers for everything, including book materials. So any expanded material that I felt was relevant. There will also be a heavy dose of maybe you should take this with a grain of salt. Because as with everything in Dragon Age, things are subject to change. And mostly that most of the documents they say that you find out of the Imperium are either completely fictional or heavily altered. So the validity of things might be off um, or it could be just completely doctored and people lie. People forget. Um, I don't entirely understand the calendar. There's a lot of like different ways to tell dates and I just ha I'm not good with it yet. It is a goal of mine to be like, okay, this is then because you know, everybody has a different calendar. If you don't know what I'm talking about, but this is me saying, if I have the timeline off at some point or another, you're welcome to correct me. Um, pronunciations. I, I try, I try really hard. <laughs> um, and if I had a source for it, I tried to. And um, if I'm saying something really weird, hey, it's it's an attempt. I made an attempt. Okay, so let's get to the actual subject of the video, which is the Taventer Imperium. Yeah, so you may know some, or you may know very little. Uh, you may know just the overtones and undertones, but mostly overtones of, ee, because, yeah, um, I shy away from it. It's sad and it's perplexing, uh, but it is crucial to the story of Thetis and particularly the human story of Thetis, which has become a lot of the story um, for Hawk. If you play Dia 2, that's she's a human. That's your only perspective, really, um, as you're the player. The first humans who came to Thetis arrived in what is today known as the Taventer Imperium. And, yeah, part of that, I have no knowledge. I will add that there is no connection that I could find of tribes of humans that ended up in Ferelden and Orlais. Beyond, uh, that doesn't mean a lot. It just means it's possible that other human, humans, yes, other humans came from other places. Totally possible. Uh, but it's something of note. Back then, they had one tribe of people, those who came to the Taventer Imperium to, of today. They were called the Neromanians. This is around negative 1300 ancient. And yes, that is how it is in the time. I don't know why they have it like that, but negative 1300 ancient. It's speculated that they came from Parvolin, the rainforest to be specific, which is today the largest Kunari inhabited place in all of Thetis. It said pyramids from those days still stand as wonders of Thetis. They get to the mainland Thetis around, yeah, the 1300 ancient and settle along the Notion Sea coastline, which, as you can see, is today's Taventer Imperium, if you were looking at it. If you weren't, uh, the Imperium is bordering that sea. That's the coastline. That's their big-ass ocean. So sometime around then, or perhaps a bit later, the near Armenian people are said to have been dreamers. So, which, for a quick note, dreamers, if you remember DA2 and Finreal, are individuals who can enter the Fade without aid of lyrium. They can shape the Fade and give people dreams. To a darker extent, they can kill someone while asleep or merely drive them mad. The reason Fenrir went to Taventer, if you let him, is because he believed he could control it there, where, you know, there's other dreamers, supposedly, which is possibly a disaster, honestly. Solus is also a dreamer and a case of extreme control over this because it is a delicate situation. It can attract a lot of attention and possession attempts. For the Neromanians, it seems they ventured to the Fade or somewhere akin to it and sought out or stumbled upon what some would call a demon and others old gods. Now, there is record of this, heavily mucked, I'm sure. And by record, I mean a canical. A canical being a history compared to the Bible of today. It's written, it's chantry, blah, blah, blah. So not to delve too deep into the old gods, what you need to know is that the maker is said to have made his firstborn spirits as creatures who exist ever changing and that the maker doesn't like this. Thus he turns in his second creations are man. 
and this sparks jealousy in the spirits. Shenanigans ensue. They seek dominion over man. From here, we have the near Armenians, presumably dreamers, somehow contacting old gods, who may or may not be demons, dragons, whatever. It says the maker was displeased and cast the firstborn to earth, but they kept speaking to man. Since the maker didn't get, he was making it worse, apparently. It says, Tevinta heard. In return for their worship, they taught them in hushed whispers the secret of darkest magic, which aligns with dreamers being taught magic from the tribe. And naturally, people are like, whoa, magic. Let's make these people priests and old gods and our rulers and such, kings, blah, blah. So this is cited around 4800 F.A., which is the founding of Arlathon, I believe, is what F.A. stands for. Uh, I think 300 years after elves noticed humans' arrival in Thetis. So even prior to formation of the Imperium, when we know nothing of why man came to Thetis, where they came from, they're already learning magic from what is in essence could be called choice spirits or demons, really. Yeah, uh, in a very bland way. I want to put a theory in, but I kind of hold back on this because it's not about me and my theories, but I really hope this inspires some people to think down the line. Okay, now back to this. We have a tribe of people who are speaking or believe they speak to gods and they're expanding their knowledge of magic. Specifically, they spoke to Dumat or Dumat, whatever, whatever you want to say it. I've heard of Dumat and Dumat. We are aware that there are priests of Dumat, so that's an assumption. Around a good chunk of time after their arrival, over 500 years, from this human tribe of near Armenians, like one expects, and so often happens, people split up for different reasons. Maybe they wanted to worship different gods, different ways of life, different rules, who knows, but that's what happens. So some stay under the near Armenians and their high king, but the rest scatter and become Tevinter, Quarnus, and Berender. It said to venture allied with the dwarves prior to the Imperium's formation, so this would have been the tribe of the Tevinter. But it is worth mentioning elves and dwarves had already been in contact in some way prior to this. So by now, elves, whatever contact they had with humans, the Nermenians, pre-Imperium, are said to have ceased interactions due to noticing of the quickening, or their immortality ceasing. Anyway, so they're now apparently afraid of humans, so is said. Tevinter was prosperous. Eventually, they absorbed the Quarnus and the remaining Neromanians, at least those who we assume remained. The Berendor were people who were said to lost favor with an old god, Dumont. He reduced them to rubble, but Solus in Dragon Age Inquisition says that the place was buried under volcanic ash, that he had found the ruins where it had been sealed tight by ash, becoming statues in the ash, people, I would assume, in buildings. There is speculation that natural disasters occurred, but I like the idea of a dumb old god smiting people. It's quite Pompeii, really. The funny thing is that to me this implies that they were the only sane sprig off that tribe to lose favor with that old god. It's, it's kind of amazing. Clearly they had more sense if that was true. But the natural disaster idea is pretty valid and would make more sense, but it's not as fun. The remaining offshoots of the near Armenians formed under Tevinter and became the Tevinter Imperium. This is 1195 ancient, or 1 Tevinter Imperium, in their calendar. In context, Elves found the Arlathen was 4,500 years before humans even came on the scene. So, by now Arlathen had been around 6,500 years by the time of Tevinter's founding. The humans are quite juvenile. They're just really been catching up in terms of a collected people, to elves that is. And during that time, before the founding of the Imperium, it was a peaceful existence between humans and elves. It's unclear if humans establishing settlements closer to Arlathan was an issue, but I can assume that happened later, to elven annoyance or not. We have no reason to believe the humans of Tevento were in conflict with the elves right then. But we do know that dwarves knew of elves, and that they admit, and that they became allied with the humans of Tevinter, not the elves, at least to our knowledge. This is vital for trade, specifically lyrium, which even today is key to their lives. Gotta get that lyrium. So we had many priests, kings, and clearly the Imperium would need some form of a ruler. Well, yeah, don't worry, there's a guy who's the high king of the near Armenian. His name is Drenius, and he's a dreamer of some apparent charisma. His origins are said to be of royalty from the Tevinter kingdom, pre-Imperium, a very Moses-like story. The story of these events says Livia, who was his mother, 
was the high queen and priestess of Razakel. Razakel, Razakel, who was making these names? Another old god. And when she was pregnant, her brother stormed her home while she was in labor. Really nice. But by the time he got to her, the baby was gone. And she fought him, but ultimately died. That baby was found in a basket on the seashore by a woman named Calpurnia, a priestess of Demot. But this was never said publicly. She raised him on her own. He would grow up to find out his heritage, and then he would duel his uncle, who was the guy who killed his mother. It's all very fairy tale. And he united the two tribes, Tevinter and the Armenians. And it's actually kind of a cool story. Revenge and stuff. And then he would go on to marry the high queen, the Quirinus, further uniting the once whole near Armenians under the Imperium now. Dorinius was instrumental in the alliance with dwarves. He sought them out, quite literally, and then he found the ruler, King Andrun Stormhammer, proving his worth and cementing a bromance, really. That's just how intense they make it sound. So naturally, he's a big deal. He's brave. He's a talented mage. He's having dreams where he sees a cloaked figure and it turns and it reveals to be him. So he's dreaming of himself in what looks like a fairy man. So it's very underworldy and kind of creepy. Not normal stuff. So he appoints himself ruler because when you do all that, you apparently can. So he's Archon of the Imperium. His sigil was the ferryman, like in his dream. And yeah, it's kind of pompous, but I guess he did a lot of stuff. So why not appoint yourself? He said to have been loved by animals, birds, and cats flock to him, who he used to use as spies. He's using animals as spies. That is my dream. Anyway. That reminds me of something. Reminds me of um, Liliana, though her animals aren't her spies, but they're just cool. Anyway, so under Durinius, the Imperium is prospering, and the alliance with dwarves means that they build this really big-ass embassy. And it's opulent because, you know, dwarves can't see the sky, so they can keep their caste living there. And they have them all over, but at this point, they had one in Menrathis and probably other places. Menrathis is indeed the largest city in Thetis still today. Today, we know Minrathis from some art shown in the comics and some descriptions I could find. It's an island of rock, actual quote, essentially. It's not too far offshore. It has a bridge that can easily be destroyed in times of war and catacombs that can hold enough food to feed the city for a year if needed. They have a lot of shipbuilding, ports, and I mean like a lot. Along with the embassy, they built the Proving Grounds, which is another wonder of Thetis. It's a triangular prism with heavy dwarven inspiration. The exterior drips with greenery, and it's referred to as the Green Jewel at the center of a stone city. At least today, it's said that Lyrium is so key because even their buildings are sustained by magic, foundations built by raising the earth itself. He established the Magisterium from the priesthood, forming the basic of today's Magister's rules which then was only a title of nobility. His role as Archon is referred to as godlike authority. It's not a monarchy, but it can be inherited by a relative, or an apprentice of the former Archon can become Archon, or someone declared before death. So generally they can choose or be elected if that is necessary, but hopefully it's not. Uh, hopefully they have settled that prior to their deaths. Their deaths. Ugh. Eventually, around 5 TE, or negative 1180 ancient, he dies. Then there was a man named Thalcyon, and he was the first noted blood mage, learning it from the old god Dumont. Dorinius declared him before his death, I should say, an honorary archon, because he had died 400 years before he declared him an archon, so I don't know how that works, but... Before he died, at some point, he was like, this dude did some good stuff with blood magic. Let's make him an honorary archon because he did so much. Cool. He's said to have been an oracle of a near Armenian king, asking the maker for victory in battle. And through this, he made a deal with what some would call a demon or a dragon or a god, perhaps, depending on how you think of it, to win the battle. In doing this, the demon asks they simply sacrifice some animals, you know, normal stuff, and also that they worship him, you know, and not the maker. Please don't worship the maker, worship us. Which in essence changed their religion, obviously. Others following suit. They did win the battle, but hey, now they're said to worship those demons, so that's great. This is in the Chan of Light, so it's definitely loosely based, if at all true. 
which I think it could be. Apparently, this gave him massive influence, power, to make the Imperium a true empire. So that's why he would have made Archon, because it's like, hey, look what you did for us. Yay, we worship these gods now, and it's all because of you. It could be that the ancient elves decided to share love and teach the humans blood magic, but that brings in a lot of theorizing. Dumont taught him blood magic. That's what he claims. So that's what I'm saying. He's also a dreamer, because all these people are, apparently. Not all, but a good deal of the powerful ones. Confusing enough, the actual Archon who followed Durinius was Thalassian, the destroyer. He's not that well documented, but he was responsible as Archon for the following events. So I'm just noting that. So empires expand. Empires consume, for whatever reason. Conflict between the elven people and the Imperium ensued. There are tales of settlements of humans near Olathan, the elven home city, disappearing. Whether the humans did seek it to dominate the elven people doesn't matter long term because we know they just wanted to expand to conquer. And they were already doing it, or would be in Ferelden with human tribes, the Imperium growing. Elves were all across Thedas. It wasn't limited to the forest of Olathan, so they were bound to run into them quite frequently. Probably enslaving them if possible. Slave trade was established quite early and still is a major part of the Imperium. Notably, Kirkwall is a prime example of where slaves were kept, which is super cheery. That's why when I'm around Kirkwall, I'm always like, ugh. Oh, God, again, these mur murals? I'm just frightened. Some claiming the captive elves helped the Tevinter people into the Fade via Lyrium, which seems to indicate the Dreamer's powers are sometimes exaggerated. So, even though it says that they didn't need it to enter, eh. Either way, we have a rising empire conquering with its immense power via lots and lots of lyrium and blood magic. Lyrium from the dwarves. Yeah. Great friendship. Dragon worship. Temples built for their dragon gods. The conflict which led magisters to stormy Arlathan is suggested because the elves were harming humans and that perhaps their existence at all was unsettling. But again, it's more likely to me that they just wanted to conquer. Honestly. More power. But that's my opinion, and it's not fact. So, by this, we know from Darken Age Inquisition that the elves were already weak from a civil war, from loss of immortality, possibly a sickness, possibly something worse. Truly, they were already destroyed. So, 214 TE to Venture Imperium, or 6619 FA, I don't know why I said it like that, <laughs> where they eventually occupied it, destroying it, or so they said, much of their culture, probably after taking and learning and, you know, I mean, yeah, enslaving those within. For six years this happened. For six years they held Arlathan. For whatever reason. The Magisterium, along with Archon Thalsian, or Thalassian, God, which one? Are, see, I wish they had their names be different. There's literally like, what, two letters difference in those names? Whatever, the Archon and the Magisters. And 220 TE sank the city in some massive feat of blood magic. So for after those six years of like completely destroying the city and taking some of the culture and hurting their people and enslaving them and probably taking some back and, you know, whatever, uh, some did manage to escape. I'm mentioning that because that's how we have the Dalish. And well, there were people outside of Arlathan, so that's a bit exaggerated. But don't worry, some got away, some. So they sank the city. Great. Um, so they say. There's some different ideas on that. Some say dragons and spirits helped, but the earth swallowed up this magical place. Why? I don't understand that. Um, anyway, some elves did flee, as I said. Some were captured and for generations have been enslaved in Tevinter. Tevinter continues to expand, conquering much of Thetis. Slave trade hubs galore are established. Conquering the Alamari people, which is a tribe in Ferelden, which I'm still not quite sure if it was an offshoot of Neuromanians or not, or if those were other humans. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, they conquered them. Either way, for a long period of time, Tevinter occupied those lands, assuming then they, they enslaved the majority of people found. So, cheery. So far south as Ferelden, east as Ravain. That's where they went. Essentially, you have Lyrium pouring into the Imperium, and I honestly don't really understand what comes out. Ships? Are they making ships? They're making stuff. I don't really know. 
the endless and pointless quest for total power to be the most magically gifted, have the fanciest hats or something like that. So now's a great time to bore you with the basics of something that's of utmost importance in the Imperium today and back then. Class. You already know about the Magisterium, but their official class is called the Altus. In the future, they will be descendants of dreamers or original magisters, those who could speak to the old gods in the Fade. Though a lot of dreamers would be slain for future terrible reasons, Dorian is an Altus, so they do have some in the future. Well, a good mount. Then you have the Leightons, the second highest ranking class. Those are people born in mage families, people who had up to a point shown no magical ability or been mages for generations, but have no link to higher altus or the dreamer class. So mages who are not related to dreamers. That's it. Then we have the Soparati, who are the common people, also known as the Sleepers. They're non-magical citizens, and they outnumber mages, yet subservants to their whims. So that's nice. The upper class control. It's an enormous merchant class composed of a lot of various roles. They can own property, serve in the military, but they can't rise in class. However, a mage born from the Soparati can rise. Supposing a mage is born into the family of class, this would be out of complete randomness, but it does happen. And Dorian talks about it in DAI, that even though this is a dream for people, if you were to be a mage born out of a Soparati family, the most you could hope for was a clerk job. Uh, he seems to feel pity for them. But no offense to him, this is very elitist, considering maybe that's a really great job for them. Uh, and I think he's seen it from a skewed perspective. So it might be true, but still. So as for slaves, even a freed slave could never be more than a liberati, not considered a citizen, very limited rights. They can join a circle of magi, which for the Taventer people is not a prison, but a university, essentially, a place to learn. They can own property, but not serve in any military or political situation. Though there are some exceptions, as vague as that seems. They can act as personal servants to magisters, I assume paid. But those slaves who won't ever be free are, essentially, as you would imagine, completely powerless. But even among slaves, there's no equality. There's attempts to rise in position, as with anything. Magical talent in slaves is an important it doesn't make a difference at all, and it generally is ignored, which we see in DAI is viewed by Corypheus as, well, wasteful, and even for him, a bit superior in humans anyway, to ignore it. The slaves are compromised of every race. There's no limit to this. Even dwarves can be slaves, despite their close relations. It doesn't seem to matter. It is a point of contention since I have found codexes where they say there are dwarven slaves, but most of the time it's humans or elves or sometimes canari. But it could change in future games, so that's up in the air. As a subtopic, the dwarves who live in various cities at the embassies, they can spend their entire lives inside avoiding the sky. And they are called the Ambassadora. They advise Archons, assuming the Archon asks or will listen and the magisterium in general. So they have a vaguely good diplomatic relationship. I mean, they're close. Both of their uh, homes would be screwed without the other. So it's a close relationship. Okay, back to the history bits. The Imperium is focused on gaining more power, more land. They've had civil wars within the Imperium, all this time still speaking to the old gods, erecting dragon temples, essentially gaining magical knowledge, skill, presumably. Magisters are power mad. The Imperial Highway is constructed to make trade easier. Kirkwall slaves are largely responsible for its construction, although dwarves note magic was used as well. It was expansive, though never finished, and most of it today is pretty crumbly. You actually walk through it in Origins with those highwaymen. Yeah, anyway. So a lot was happening, and maybe not enough actual watching over anyone, because magic ruled and there was no real limitations. Go ahead, Jimmy. Do whatever you want. Go ahead. Do that bad thing over there. Whatever. Magic is great. There would be inner conflict. People warring within to venture for rulership, for power. A civil war, essentially. When you have a society built on who's the most powerful dude, because it's always a dude, apparently, you expect inner turmoil. It stemmed from the next archon named 
Almadrius, wanting to appoint an apprentice who was a lowborn mage. Classy. Which is actually a great idea in theory. Assassination attempts ensue. Greed, etc. The boy who was to be the next Archon, Tyderon, took the throne by force after the Archon was killed. Even though he took the throne, he didn't stay there. He died while on the throne with no heir. They quite literally fought for 20 years over that vacant throne. Eventually, a former high priest of Dumont, Parthenius, took the place of Archon, ending the war by the Magisterium permitting some of the Latins to the temple to take spots on the Magisterium. Even when it was somewhat settled, the golden age of the Imperium had cut to an end. So they were like, yeah, this is awesome. We're beating on everyone else. And then, you know, stuff happened within and that period of being so powerful and seemingly very together is just over. So they're not golden anymore, apparently. Then in 1800 TE, something is brewing from within the Imperium. I want to give you context for this because I feel it's important, but I want to not overdo it here. So I'm going to give you the basics of what you need to know about this situation and about the old gods. Okay? There are seven. Dumont is the Dragon of Silence who we most know as being in contact with dreamers and many descendants of them. This is some odd a thousand years plus that they've been in contact. So then we have Earthamiel, which, God, I hope I'm saying right, the god of beauty, Lusakan, Lusakan, Watchman of Night, Toth, the Forge Rite of Fire, Jesus, what the hell kind of name is that? Adoral, <laughs> appraiser of slavery. That's not funny. Razakal, augur of mystery. Zazakal, who I hope they're related. Madmen of chaos. So we do not know if all of them are men or if they have a gender to begin with. Dumont, I assume, is a man. Um, yeah, so I got there. So Urthamiel, Lusakan, <laughs> Toth, Adoral, Razakal, and Zazakal. <laughs> Ooh, those are some names, Bioware. You're killing me here. There is some suggestion there was an eighth god, but it seems to be a really sensitive subject and not a lot of people consider it now. Um, so, yeah. So, we don't know the genders, blah, blah, everything's up in the air. But Dumont is assumed to be male. So, Dumont being the one who was said to have destroyed an offspring of the Nearmenian tribe for not gaining his favor somehow. That dude. Not great dude. They're often called dragons, which aligns with their dragon worship of Deventer. Whether that's actually true is pretty unclear to me. Whether dragons are purely demons or someone's godly form, quite unclear. Now, it's been a fairly long amount of time, and the magisters are powerful. They know blood magic. They have a heap of lyrium flowing in. And there's just no way I believe the old gods didn't tell the magisters to come to them somehow. Show them how. And I said I'd stay out of theories, but I do want to mention that if you were the firstborn children of a maker, a god, who you believe to be a god, even whatever, a parent, and you felt abandoned and you reached out to this new creation to show not only were they lesser than you, but they were so easily manipulated and controlled and corrupted. So it seems like that's a possible scenario to me. So assuming you believe any of this or that their maker exists, turning them from the maker to you, his cast off. So you say, hey, dummies, go see the maker. He totally wants to see you. He'd be so proud. And the magisters are like, uh, hell yes, let's go. We're really powerful and great. And we will go and we'll rule this shit. We belong there. But that doesn't happen. So, end of speculation. I might have gone off there. Okay. The chant of light says, then a voice whispered within their hearts. You are the lords of earth. Go forth to claim the empty throne of heaven and be gods. Playing to their ego. So it says. I added that one. That's, it doesn't say plain to their ego. That's my bit. Sorry. <laughs> Regardless of why, whose idea it was, the Magisterium performed a feat. They slew hundreds of slaves. <sighs> Used ridiculous amounts of lyrium, said to be two-thirds of the supply in the whole empire. Two-thirds! Two th I said they had a lot of lyrium, right? Now, in a picture, two-thirds of, like, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of lyrium. Two thirds. <sighs> so they somehow managed to 
physically enter the Fade and to find a golden city. To show him, the maker, daddy, look what I did. The events that followed are widely contested, denied, twisted. What is commonly believed is that they entered and with their humanity, essentially blackened the city or corruption, whatever. Blackened the city, the maker's seat. Either way, he turned away or he was never there. Which, you know. But doing what they had done, being where they should not have been, blackened their souls. and made them into hideous creatures, ungodly, if you will. The maker cast them out to earth and once more now is dark spawn because apparently he realized, wow, these new creations suck. They really suck. And he abandoned for it. He's like, eh, bye. The old gods, surprise, surprise, didn't speak to anyone of their followers after this. So those old gods who've been saying, hey, you should come do this. They're like, eh, so whatever happened to them, we don't know. We do now have fancy arch demons to remember them by, each representing a new blight. Earth and male being the one we dealt with in the fifth blight. I can't wait for Razakel's blight, assuming they go in order. So yeah, that's that would be the next, the sixth blight, assuming we see that. Earth and male's soul was preserved if you did the Morgan ritual in Origins, and then taken by Mithal and Kirin, the son of Morgan, if you let her. It's all great fun, really. So the aftermath of this was really not, you know, good. It was bad. Uh, it began the first blight, which ultimately led to the death of Dumont, the first archdemon. I will eventually do a maker cast, but for now, you really just need to know that Dumont was slain, the magisters corrupted, they had become the first darkspawn. The Grey Wardens were formed and were obviously instrumental in aiding the first blight. Thanks, Deventer, you helped so much. Uh, not really. But it lasted for freaking 200 years. 200 years! It ravaged Thetis. And it took 90 years for the Grey Wardens to be founded. And then nearly after that, another 100 for it to end. So, I mean, can you imagine? No, I can't. So their power, both actual power and their perceived power to the rest of Thetis, was diminished significantly. You know, they sat on their ass. You know, they did. Ashamed, but also fearful. My bias or not, they were complete idiots, okay? So in 7397 F.A., Dumont was slain. The blight ended, and somewhere a girl was born who would be pivotal to Thetis' religion forever, Andraste. In 7420 F.A., or 1015 T.E., Andraste, an escaped slave, wife of an Avar tribe leader, with a barbarian army to follow, who believed herself to speak to the Maker, to be a holy figure, led the first exalted march, and it was incredibly effective. I should restate that I'm not quite sure about her personal but perspective on it, but people believe she was, and she said she was, so that's what I can say. Whatever they had rebuilt of themselves, the Imperium, it was not a match. Andraste was only 23. She was my age, and leading an army... In the cities, slaves revolted. It was a good fight on all their parts. She managed to conquer most of the South, but she ultimately fell for reasons I will contest at a later date, but she was burned alive. It's just, yeah, betrayed by a jealous husband. If you believe the Chantry, if you believe people in general, that's what happened, they say. Something did come out of this. Their then Archon, Hasarian, had taken pity on her while she was burning and put a sword through her heart. Some say out of compassion. Some say the Maker spoke to him. Ten years later, he claimed the voice of the Maker, as the blade touched Andraste, sparked him to convert to the chant of light. For some reason, it took him a while. Uh, he declared the Maker the one true God and told the world about Mafarath's betrayal of his wife, which apparently hadn't been widespread. But some say there was a pressure to do so and that this was all an act. To convert it all was completely an act. To break things up, there's a DA2 uh, about a porno spoof called Hasarian Spear, which is about Andraste and Hasarian. Um, that's special. It's great stuff. So, um, okay, back to what I was talking about. You can imagine some people in Deventer refused to give up worshipping their gods, but some were glad of it, mostly non-mage citizens. How shocking, right? Uh, those who were glad of it helped overthrow magisters. A lot of bloodshed was wrought. This was over a hundred years before Orlais became an exalted state, godly or whatever, before it had the Chantry. 
So this period of time was called the Transfiguration. The temples of the old gods were made into the Circle of Magi. Uh, they attempted to really wash over their rampant dragon worship, but they did keep it as a symbol because it was integral and apparently super powerful to them. And it is. I like dragons. Dragons are cool. Why not? So he reformed the Imperium rather drastically, perhaps not entirely for the better, but a tish more publicly acceptable, if only a little bit. The Archon would have served as head of the Chantry during that time. As always, dragon worshippers linger, but for the public eye, the Imperium now worshipped the Maker. But of course, the rest of Theta saw the Maker's will a bit differently, and when they pressed the Imperium to conform, they did, but only in their own way. You can imagine they weren't fond of magic or magisters, considering in Drosday's magic is to serve man deal. So the rest of Thetis was like, hey, this is what we're saying. This is not what you're doing. Hey, why don't you? And they were like, all right, whatever. I'll do this thing and then we'll be good. So, so some things that would happen between the second blight, Taventer would stay out of it in favor of protecting their land, despite attempts from Darkspawn to take Murnrathus. They abandoned the Anderfells and anywhere else who needed aid. So Taventer survives the second blight by a mile. The Anderfells are greatly maimed by the Darkspawn, and the blight ends. Taventer would gain control of Starkhaven, then lose it. Halim Shirel, slightly off topic, is conquered, just to give you a timeline here. Elves are doing very badly in another video, but still, elves are doing badly. Now we reach the Tower's Age. Flemeth would be born in 7799. And then the third blight would erupt about 10 years after her birth. Dark Spawn, indeed, would come to Taventer and circulate around Marnos Pell and Barentium, at least within the Imperium. And then Grey Wardens, of course, would swoop in. But Taventer and Orle were also hit very hard and sat back, of course. But yeah, that's their deal. They sit back. But both of the countries do finally come in and aid and the blight. So that's something. Um, but of course, Taventer takes to occupying the land they fought in, Hunter Fell. And so does Orle. So yeah, uh, they took the city of or uh, Navarra, Orle did. So both of them, pretty shitty. It doesn't last. In a little less than 20 years, both lands break away. So they kept it for 20 years and eh, done now. So Blight's over, but of course now is the time to have arguments about religion and the Chantry, which is the same dance that it always is. The Imperial Chantry has a new male divine, Ulala, and he believes blood magic should be prohibited, but otherwise, fine with mages, really. He's like, hey, this is awesome, because it's Deventer. And then they basically punch the anti-magic Chantry in the gut by saying, look, Andraste wasn't divine. She was not a divine prophet. No, she was a prophet woman with magical abilities. The white divine, the non-imperial Chantry divine, attempts to leash them, and of course fails. When the Divine, Divine Joyous, the second dies, Minrathus is off their ass with joy. Like, it's it's amazing. They're so happy, like, yeah. And that day is made a holiday. So you can imagine if it was reversed, the anger. So you make the death of this woman who is held so high in their regard a holiday and you're celebrating it. Oh, yeah, there's going to be problems. That's the sort of hatred the Black Divine and the Imperium had for her, it seems, and the Chantry elsewhere indeed. The Black Age stems from this anger towards Taventer's utter disrespect, condemning the False Divine in the North, aka the Black Divine. So, in 7939, the Chantry declares four exalted marches to Taventer. They do manage to get quite far, fairly successful in penetrating Taventer, but ultimately they fail to conquer Minrathus. This only serves to further separate the Imperial Chantry, and they start forming their own rules at this time in a really extreme way, further distinguishing themselves, probably just making things up to suit their needs, honestly. So mages from the south are flooding into Deventer, which isn't always wise considering their policies on rank. So having no rank would be not great. Uh, maybe even someone into slavery, depending on your race and skill. This serves the Imperium well, as people under your thumb equals power. So the Divine attempts to make a push to vilify the Imperium more with research on blood magic and protecting yourself from it and possession, which isn't a bad route to take. I mean, that, that's something you should do. But I doubt that it was rooted in kindness so much as you shouldn't go there. Deventer is bad. Bad Deventer, bad. It's still wise, but 
This whole time, the Chantries, and therefore the Imperium versus Orle, still warring. If you couldn't tell that they were, it's not great. And then we enter the Exalted Age. 1809, the last Exalted March to the Imperium occurs, and Orle retreats, just in time for the Fourth Blight, putting a pen in that war, because, hey, you could all die, so hmm, I want to rethink your timing. It lasts 12 years, and Tevinter isn't terribly hit hard. They push the dark spawn back. Of course, they don't send any aid to anyone, and Orle isn't much better because, yeah, but they do help some. To break it up, Kirkwall declares Nugs a noxious vermin, possibly carrying the blight, and an extermination of them becomes known as the Battle of Squealing Plains. Yeah, it's quite sad. Or hilarious that they would do that. What weirdos. But also sad. A plague and losses in the blight cause griffins to go extinct, but you can read some extended material, specifically the last flight, and maybe that's not entirely the case today, but still, that's what happened then. A lot of drama among other countries, but it's pretty quiet in Devendor, funny enough. Dragons, however, are nearly extinct, thanks to Navara. This is supposedly a good thing, but I love dragons, even knowing that they have um, issues with not destroying and murdering. But humans have that too, so what can I say? Now the Canari come onto the scene, swiftly conquering Parvalin from the very confident Tevinters. People only find out after the Canari ships land in Ravane and the Saharan coast. The Canari really kick some ass and conquer the hell out of the land surrounding Tevinter. So Ravane and Antiva and a great deal of the Imperium itself, even Menrathus is under heavy attacks. So at this point, that's the only real safe place and it's still struggling. And then in comes the Avar, who deserve a video of their own. They come in and they save the day, pushing the Kunari back, at least in the Imperium. So following that clusterfuck, a new Archon is elected. No Moran, who strikes away the ban of mages taking part in politics. This is around, give or take, ten-ish years later, when Liliana's story of Aveline, the female knight posing as a man, then ultimately dying, but not before demolishing some male opponents, and she's unmasked to be a woman, and the emperor is so moved that he starts to allow women to be knights. Huzzah! So the Canari are still fucking about, nothing changes, and then it does. All lands but Tevinter come together with the Kunari and sign a peace treaty. So a lot of humans and Kunari are like, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. This is kind of exhausting. So humans and Kunari are at peace, except the dumbass Tevinters. Seventy-ish years later, the Kunari invades Heron again, which is Tevinters. Tevinter is alone this time in the fight, so they end up losing to Heron. But they settle down, sort of. But not really, because they're still at war today, so... Endless. So here's your timeline. About now, Alistair's grandmother is murdered, aka Merrick's mother. Uh, Merrick and the events of the Stolen Throne, which is a book you should read, those all go on. House Tethris is exiled to the surface, aka Varric's family. And now, now we are just, we, uh, we have made it, okay? We have made it to the Dragon Age. Do you know what this means? This means I'm done talking about that. Oh, I feel so nice. I'm so happy right now. My soul is cleansed. It's nice to know things, but dear God, it is draining, isn't it? Okay. All right. So we're at the Dragon Age. Yay. So it's 8399. Empress Selene is born. Merrick, Alistair's dad, is crowned King of Ferelden. The current Archon, Davin, is facing some attempts to usurp the throne. And ultimately, they kill him. He's assassinated. In 929 Dragon, whether or not his successor, Radinus, the current Archon, had a hand in this is up for debate. There's no end to the people who want power and feel really stabby. Uh, Titus, who you can read about in the comics for DA, I'll put a link to those uh, below. He's quite an intriguing figure. Uh, he headed a dragon cult, one of many. There's a lot, by the way, uh, which are more prominent than Deventer would ever say. They don't say it at all, really, but they exist and... I'm not sure if everyone is mad at that or not. He may or may not be involved. So, long list of people. But spoilers, uh, Titus died. So whether or not he did, I mean, it seems like Radonis probably did it. So today, Rad Radonis. Got it. I like Radonis. It sounds like radish. Uh, okay. So today, Archon Radonis. Radonis. 
<laughs> oh god, I'm losing it. Okay, so today Archon Radonis rules the Imperium, which frankly, uh, not a lot known of him, except that he's intelligent, he's a cunning man, he's powerful, and he possibly likes cats. So I like cats. I think we could be friends. He would probably murder me, but I think we could be friends. Um, he was featured in Mage Killer, which is the Dragon Age new comic from Dark Horse. We saw him at the end of number one and number two, and I don't know if we'll see him again. Uh, he was somewhat sensible, not to spoil it. Uh, he's an Archon. He's not a great guy. He's not nice. That's not spoiling it too heavily, but he's not a nice man. So don't expect that. Um, which brings me to stuff that's less history and more, this is Tevinter. This is what their culture is, their life is. As a subnote, uh, fashion is apparently a big thing uh, in the comics. You kind of see some very fashionable people. And yeah, you would expect that kind of like relay. They're very fancy, but in like a much darker way, like a like maybe they wanted to be goth and it didn't quite work out. Something like that. Love my goths. But yeah, that's what they tried to be. So what their culture is like, their life is like. They have a language, which I neglected to mention. It's called Tavine. And in DA2, Fenris will speak some, and then Dorian will occasionally speak some. He calls his love interest Amatis, which is a term of endearment, like my love or something. Ivana is hello. Kafas is shit, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, Manavaris Dracona means long live the dragons. Mandavaris Dracona. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, Vishanti Kafas. Vishanti Kafas, yeah, is you shit on my tongue. Yeah, uh, I believe Dorian said that, which is why I love him. Vishanti Kafas. That's what I feel like right now. There's not a, t a ton of words. I wrote ton instead of ton. Oh my god. I wrote, uh, yeah, okay. But there is some you can check out on the wiki. Tevinter has a tea called Veramensis, which is the most expensive beverage in Thetis, and it's from parts of the Phoenix. A Phoenix, yeah. Which is uh, interesting. They breed Dracolisks, which are skeletal horse-like face things, and they're used in their cavalry and military. Um, they're magically altered, though, and it is thought that they come from dragons and wivens. So, Archons of late, and probably Radonis, own ones who spit or breathe fire or ice. Um, said some could spit poison, but I don't think that today that would be what it is but some apparently have super powerful assuming some still worship dragons versus a maker the belief is that the souls of the dead are reborn as dragons naturally uh, whether or not that's widespread considering they don't technically worship dragons anymore i don't know but some people believe that to be forged anew rising on burning wings that's the quote about that the templars do exist in the imperium but they do not have real power. They don't use spells. They're soldiers who watch for abuse of magic, quote unquote, and supposedly enforce it if someone was. But let's be honest here. Um, who's going to enforce that? Who? And uh, who's going to let themselves be seen with some stupid non-magical folk? I assume they're non-magical. Um, anyone who would question blood magic and publicly oppose it tends to be dealt with in a permanent manner, despite that it's not legal, which we know. So if they live through this coming out against blood magic, they're shunned. Dorian has things to say about Deventer, but he never says enough, honestly. He talks about how genealogy is super important, how he knows, like, his whole family tree. Um, they keep records of humans, uh, seeing who could produce a mage at any time. Some keep spirits as servants. He says it's quite marvelous. Quite marvelous, Dorian. Do not enslave spirits, people. This is my warning to you. It never ends well. Apparently, people are made tranquil at the drop of a hat for supposed magical abuse, but often just being on the wrong end of an argument. So, a lot of tranquils. Oh, and that apparently there are flying cows over Minerathus uh, with no wings. I don't know how that works. Uh, it's perplexing. He claims that men and women entered the Black City, which is news for me, because as I said, there was never a gender mention, and he's saying men and women. I had assumed it was the boys club, as I said, but apparently it's not a boys club. And I'm excited at the prospect of one of the magisters or a couple of the magisters being women. Ah, oh, okay. So there's sacrifices, demon summoning, blood magic is a huge issue, as I said. It's safe to assume that any mage of rank does it. So life for slaves? Yeah, 
um, you can assume it's not great. Uh, much worse. In Dragon Age Mage Killer, we see slaves, we see opulence, we see proof of how much labor and magic would be needed to maintain Renrathus alone. How much Illyrium you would need. Uh, you can find a lot of codexes which address the slaves into Venter, having someone you love disappear because the master of the house, uh, your master, wanted a boost of power, just a little more magic, so one more elf life or human life or Kunari life. It's, it's really repulsive. That's truly the worst part of this, having to go through things like that, really. Um, Fenris, we know, suffered so much abuse. He's not alone in this. Slavery is illegal in other parts of Thetis, and yet it is known that other areas just don't use the title blatantly. If you remember Loghain, you can technically go and sell anyone from anywhere else to Tevinter. So, yeah, um, you could just, like in the alienage, taking them. So that that happens. It's just Tevinter is literally so blatant about it and has so many slaves um, to be a slave would obviously to be abused and beaten and occasionally drained of blood, uh, or more than occasionally to be sexually assaulted, to be property. And again, slaves are human, Kunari and Elven and possibly dwarf. I believe that elves are probably more abundant. The question of dwarven slaves is, you know, up in there, but I believe that they are enslaved in some cases, maybe not as much as uh, humans or as much as elves, maybe as much as humans, but. The sources are unclear, except mentions of moving dwarven slaves outside of the Imperium, um, which it might have been the Venatori moving dwarven slaves. I cannot remember. So I have some bits here taken from codexes about slaves into Venter. Sometimes these are out of um, order. Sometimes I cut out some stuff to only get to the important bits. So just know that. It says... Despite widespread illiteracy, Tevinter's slaves have developed a series of small pictograms that they scrawl on walls or under furniture, hidden from their uncaring owners. Regional variations make deciphering them a unique challenge. In one city, the sign of a clenched fist means a murderous master. In another, the same symbol indicates a harsh slave owner, but not one with a fatal temper. So, ways to help who might come after you, supposing you leave or are killed, or, you know, can't publicly say it, which is sad. In Tevinter, a slave is invisible, even though the entire empire rests on their backs, or our backs, it says. Our hands built the walls of Manrathus and carry its wealth along the crumbling roads. Can't help but think of the old stories that cross the slave markets like lightning, how centuries ago the ancients built their cities with blood magic raising the very towers and walls with terrible rituals, using our lives as fuel. Thousands of slaves were sacrificed as we were forced onto the altars of the old gods. Ugh, so depressing. Though we may be punished, few slaves are dragged to the altar or milked of blood without at least some reprimand. So, ugh, it's unclear to me if they do that and then they die as a result. Um, or if they're just taking blood in small increments, or if it differs. Oof, this is depressing. Magister Delphine seems different. She carries an aura she has never had before. The rumors fly that a bitter rival has been publicly humiliated in a duel of magic. Through my grief, I fear, I know, that my Leonora's life was the price. This was this man's daughter, I believe. I ache to speak as an equal with Magister Delphine to demand answers. But such an audience would be a joke to her. No one sees a slave. So, it's cheery. It's cheery stuff. Uh, it's hard to move on from that, but um, I kind of have to for my sanity. But just know that sometimes slaves do escape. Fenris escaped, uh, even though he had more power than most slaves do. Um, it's difficult, but they do escape. And I know Doreen remarks that some slaves don't question their roles, it's just how it is. But I want to tell you right now, that's shit. I mean, maybe some, but at one point or another, I, I truly believe that it would be impossible for... No. So, some might, but um, we know for a fact that there are slave uprisings all the time. We know that. Uh, whether or not he talks about it, whether or not they're concealed, they happen often. So, Dorian's thoughts on this, even if he's very progressive for a to venture man or woman... 
and if he's progressive for his people, whatever, uh, it's still incredibly ignorant at times. And even with my love for him, there is a certain ignorance to his world, even though he knows it's wrong, mostly. Uh, Calpurnia technically was liberated by Corpheus from slavery. Um, you know, he said it was ridiculous to have the brilliant power before uh, them and not use it, and that was what's wrong with the Empire. I love Calpurnia, even if we probably won't see her again. Uh, we do see her in expanded material. I'm not going to spoil that too much, but we see her briefly. Um, spoiler, if you don't let her go, you might see that she might die, but I don't think she does. It's very vague. I don't think she does. Um, her wish was to rebuild the Imperium free of corruption. It might seem like a ridiculous goal, but I personally let her go in an attempt to do that on my playthrough. And I really hope we see her again. Um, we don't know what happens to her if we don't side with her. There's no mention of that, so it's unclear how that would change the future games. Calpurnia was indeed, at least from Bioware's standpoint, named after the Priestess of Dumont, who, the founder of the Imperium, that was his adoptive mother, who helped him, and um, he was very responsible for building the Imperium. So that's just a fun fact. Uh, she also likes mint tea, Calpurnia, the Calpurnia of today. And that's all I've got. Uh, she does have a quote on the Imperium. She says, it doesn't have to be this way. The empire used to be different. When a person's life was spent, it meant something. It bought something. If slaves had a voice, the Archon could hear. So that's what she says. And I have hope for her. And she has really killer armor. So I just, I want to see her again. All right. So enough about that. Into Venter, the need for superiority, the needless fight for power. Dorian's story is highlighted, but him being gay isn't the real issue. And I say that knowing that it sounds bad, but Tevinter doesn't necessarily have a problem with someone being gay, but it's more that for the families uh, to further the lines in his father's mind, attempting to change him to rip everything Dorian out of him is not about his disapproval of him loving another man, but of not having anyone to make his line look good. Um, so it is homophobic. Surely, it's a sickness, and in comics we see Maveris, who is a woman who was born with male genitalia, um, but she's living her life as herself, as a female. Um, so she probably is sneered at, but because of who her father was, she was pretty lucky and she got some slack on that, but it's still looked down upon. And I really hope we see her again. Maveris is a great character, and I like her a lot. So if there were three key words for Tevantar, it's power, magic, and slavery. It's simplistic, but really, they cling to things. It's really disturbing. So here's where I can go on a tangent about my beliefs on how they maintain control over everything and how that is even possible. And um, how even maybe if a kind magister or resident wanted to do something, there's not much they can do. I mentioned the dreamers. Again, you don't have to listen to this if you don't want to hear our theory. It's not fact. Um, so I mentioned the dreamers, the elements to one is entering someone's dream and to alter someone's mind. And that's all I will say, because I believe they use blood magic, lyrium, remaining dreamers, uh, even, which is poor news for that kid who went to train, because we do know dreamers exist. And I just find it hard to believe that they can keep slaves from kicking their ass that many slaves. I don't know. So even the mage slaves, without the aid of something to subdue them, whether it's merely magic and lyrium or dreamers altering everyone or all of them combined, um, I just find it super possible. And it's something that struck me very hard. And I'd be interested to know if anyone thinks that as well. But okay, over. So at the end of Trespasser, we see the Inquisitor strike into the map near Solus, which is a small village or city or something in Deventer. Um, I think it's small anyway. Uh, Solus says that he grew up a dreamer, um, different in a small village. I'm just sitting here like, huh, maybe. I don't know. I really don't know. But um, he said it was his name, his real name, I think. I don't know. Who knows? I'm just sitting here shrugging because, ugh. So we're going to Deventer. I'm, I'm incredibly positive of this. In some contexts, we're going. It's not even a doubt for me. Whether we start in Deventer is another matter, but it seems like seeing Dorian and have a story that begins and ends there would make so much sense. And, you know, I'm tired of being teased, okay? Bioware, give me Deventer. There's a lot of speculation as to how, if we play as a slave or citizen, 
Um, but frankly, for me, if they pass up the opportunity to play as a slave who um, escapes or starts an uprising, I'm, I'd be shocked if they passed on that. I think it's a completely... I think it's a compelling story. It's incredibly immersive. It's deeply emotional, uh, which is something I feel like was lacking in the backstory of Inquisition, which is something that is sad for me because I felt like there needed to be a little more of a, a personable quality. You kind of have to really make that up. I would be nice if we got that because definitely playing as a slave would be an emotional thing to do. I don't know about you, but I'm really ready for that story. Um, we're going to have to wait, but still I'm ready for it. So thank you for listening. And as always, any information you want to contribute or expand on would be awesome. Anything I screwed up on, uh, there was a lot to do. So please feel free um, to correct me, but try to source me if you can so I can be sure about it. I want to thank the countless threads on Bioware's forums who helped me um, just in what the information they had there. The wiki, Bioware itself, for having the comics and the books and the expanded materials. Yeah, the tweets, Tumblr. I mean, there were some people at Bioware tweet and that was helpful for some corrections and things. Um, they were essential to me putting this together. So I'm definitely going to do more on lore. Whether or not the frequency is as much as I'd like is beyond me. I'm going to try though. Um, what I do next is sort of up in the air. I have some ideas, but soon I'll get on that and hopefully keep this semi-regular. It's important to me and it's intriguing to me. So I'm in on this. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something. That's all I can hope for. This is Commander Tempest signing off. Okay, bye.